open the score of Vaughan Williams' last symphony, his ninth, and it is like being swept into the world of author and poet Thomas Hardy, especially one of his Wessex novels, and in particular, Tess of the Durbervilles. Unlike Elgar, who couldn't live out of sight of the Malvern Hills, it is difficult to connect a particular landscape to the English composer Rafe Vaughan Williams with any certainty, but there are clues. Vaughan Williams was born at Down Ampney, that same Gloucestershire in the Cotswolds, but he spent much of his childhood where I am now. I am in the Surrey Hills and I'm making for Leith Hill Place where he used to live. Later in life he chose the market town of Dorking, not far away from that direction. He lived there for over 20 years. Now, I was born in Dorking, and I actually lived around the corner from where he lived at White Gates in Nutcombe Lane. Now, I didn't see him during that period, but a little later on, I enrolled, I became a boy soprano in the local church choir and we had to sing in the choruses in the annual performances of the Bach St. Matthew Passion. Now, you've just seen, you've just heard the opening of the Ninth Symphony. I understand that the composition of that opening was influenced by the opening chorus of the Bach St. Matthew Passion. Anyway, I'm on my way to Leith Hill Place, and incidentally, I like to think that this wonderful countryside in the Surrey Hills had an influence on his music. So, do come with me. Although previously owned by the Wedgwood family, the house today is not much more than a shell. Previously occupied by a school, so don't expect to see how it would have looked in the 1870s, there are some interesting artefacts. However, the view over the Sussex Weald to the South Downs has hardly changed. It is a fabulous vista that contributes to the unique atmosphere of Leith Hill Place that I like to think influenced his music. Only a few places are mentioned by name in his works. Antarctica, the Sinfonia Antarctica of his Seventh Symphony, is too far for a visit, but the Fens are closer and more accessible. In the Fen country and Norfolk Rhapsody were composed during his early years and contained tunes collected from his pilgrimages around the country when he notated down the dying art of folk song.
some tunes were added as new melodies to the English hymnal for the congregation to sing. They were given names echoing where they were recorded, or, in the case of Come Down, O Love Divine, his birthplace down amply. The tune collected at and named Monk's Gate, a hamlet south of Horsham, was used for Who Would True Valor See, also known as To Be a Pilgrim, to words by John Bunyan, author of The Pilgrim's Progress. The scene conjured up by the lark ascending could be anywhere in England, but many were misled by the landscape portrayed in a pastoral symphony. It followed his hugely successful sea and London symphonies, but this time the landscape was not in Britain, and neither was it one inhabited by frisking lambkins or cows looking over gates. It was composed shortly after World War I, and although cast as a symphony, it is a requiem for those killed in conflict, in a landscape more akin to those painted by Paul Nash, the war artist, and poignantly portrayed by a solo E-flat trumpet playing only natural notes, creating an otherworldly last post. The London Symphony started life as a tone poem when Vaughan Williams lived in Chelsea, soon developing into a symphony as a reminder of Edwardian England before World War I. As well as depicting the chimes of Big Ben, London's quiet green spaces are balanced with the city's more opulent moments. Williams regarded his music as absolute, but Fantasia on a theme by Thomas Tallis is associated with Gloucester Cathedral. Scored for double string orchestra and string quartet, Vaughan Williams had the cathedral's vast spaces in mind. The premiere at the 1910 Three Choirs Festival established his reputation. 
Now, I appreciate music visually, and the antiphonal effects between the double string orchestra and quartet are like moving from wide angle to close up with a zoom lens. Vaughan Williams had lessons from the French composer Maurice Ravel, adding, as he commented, a touch of French polish to his music. One of the first fruits of this relationship was on Wenlock Edge for tenor, piano and string quartet, and later orchestra, to extracts from A Shropshire Lad by A. E. Hausman. To Hausman's annoyance, Vaughan Williams omitted the third and fourth verses of Is My Team Ploughing, claiming that it was a composer's right to make changes provided it did not alter the sense. Let me read the oft-read tale again, the story of that Oxford scholar poor who one summer morn forsook his friends and came, as most men deemed, to little good, but came to Oxford and his friends no more. But rumours hung about the countryside that the lost scholar long was seen to stray. Seen by rare glimpses, pensive and tongue-tied. And I myself seem half to know thy looks and put the shepherds, wanderer, on thy trace. You find me in Oxfordshire. I'm on my way back to Oxford, having taken that famous view of the city of dreaming spires. I'm afraid at the moment there's a lot of dreaming cranes there as well. That phrase was coined by Matthew Arnold, and that's one of the reasons why I am here, and in particular his poems Thersis and the Scholar Gypsy. It's about a scholar who goes away with gypsies never to return and the speaker is going back to these places of old hoping to see his friend Thersis but of course he never returns and Rayford Williams adapts the verses for his own purpose to express the loss of friends during the two world wars. An Oxford elegy is for speaker and also a chorus and a small orchestra and it lasts about 20 minutes. You can actually download the music off the internet. I find it a very strangely moving work and that's one of the reasons why I am here. That single elm tree bright against the west. I miss it. Is it gone? We prized it dearly. 
While it stood, we said, our friend the scholar Gypsy was not dead. While the tree lived, he in these fields lived on. Perhaps I should have started with Songs of Travel, but I am going to bring matters home with his opera The Pilgrim's Progress, which took up much of his time. It was a labour of love, and Bunyan's book was a companion during his service as a medical orderly in the First World War. Although premiered, his hopes for the opera were never fulfilled, and it is still not often performed today. The opening scene of the opera takes place in Bedford Jail, where John Bunyan was incarcerated. The house, beautiful, was inspired by Houghton House, now in ruins, and it is widely thought that the Chiltern Hills, as viewed from Ampt Hill Park, are the delectable mountains. A byproduct of the Pilgrim's Progress has fascinated me. It has become one of his most fruitful works, the fifth symphony. Vaughan Williams lost faith in the opera and, fearing that it would never be performed, he extracted some of the music for his new symphony. It was composed during the Second World War, quite likely in docking, and despite the terrible conflict abroad and the threat of an invasion, like a pastoral symphony, it is one of his most serene and moving utterances. As with the Talus Fantasia and its association with Gloucester Cathedral, for me the Fifth Symphony evokes the Surrey Hills. We have a Pilgrim's Way, a different one to Banyans. It contours along the southern slopes of the North Downs, not far from Vaughan Williams' home, White Gates, taking today's pilgrims to Canterbury. It is known now as the North Downs Way. <laughs> 